We've mentioned previously in this course that a steady current can create a magnetic field, but we've never gone over methods to derive the expression of the magnetic field created by a steady current. And that's actually what we're going to do in the second half of this chapter. We're going to look at two methods to find the expression of the magnetic field created by a steady current distribution. The first method is going to be the Biot-Savart law, which is applicable all the time. It always works. The downside is that it's at the cost of quite a bit of calculus sometimes. And the second method is Ampere's law, which doesn't always apply. You need a sufficient symmetry of your current distribution in order to apply Ampere's law to derive the magnetic field easily. But if you do have sufficient symmetry, then it's very quick to find the expression of the magnetic field. It's very similar to Gauss's law in that sense, at least in spirit. Gauss's law is very useful if you have sufficient symmetry of your charge distribution. Otherwise, it really isn't very helpful to find the expression of E. But when you do have that symmetry, then it's easy to find the expression of E, and we've done that. So let's talk about the Biot Savart law. And then in later videos, we'll go over the classic examples in which you can apply the Biot Savart law and get a reasonable integral to compute the magnetic field created by the current distribution. Now, the Biot Savart law, first of all, has no physical justification. In other words, it's a mathematical construct. It's really just a formula that works. Not sure why, but it works. And what it does is that it tells you for a given little infinitesimal piece of current, IDL, it tells you what the infinitesimal magnetic field, dB, is at a point P in space. To compute the expression of dB, you would use the following formula. You would say that dB is mu naught IDL cross r hat divided by 4 pi r squared. Now we need to define all these terms and figure out what they represent. But for now, the idea is that we have dB at a given point in space. And if we want the magnetic field created by the entire current distribution, then we can integrate over the current distribution. But first, we need to find dB at a given point. Now, what is r hat and what is r? Because the other quantities, we understand what those are. IDL is an arbitrary piece of current somewhere. And then R is going to be the distance between the base of IDL and the point P, where we're trying to find dB. So this distance here is R. And while I'm at it, I'm going to introduce an angle here that is theta. This is for later convenience. Then the question is, what is R hat? Well, R hat is a unit vector, first of all. In other words, it's only there for direction, and you draw our hat by, at point P, drawing a vector that points away from the base of IDL and has a length of 1. And of course, is aligned with R. Now, the length of 1, of course, you can't really represent that on the drawing, but you need to keep it in mind for the magnitude of dB at that point. Because the magnitude of dB, since we know the magnitude of a cross product, is going to be mu naught I dl multiplied by the magnitude of r hat, which is 1, and then sine of the angle between dl and r hat, and that's theta. Divide that by 4 pi r squared. And so the game is to figure out db created at a point p of interest, and then integrate over the current distribution to find the total magnetic field created at that point. And so you need to know what IDL stands for, what R hat stands for, how you draw it, how do you find the angle theta between DL and R hat, and what little r stands for, which is this distance here. Now it is worth noting, let's just make a little bit of room to do that, that in some cases, you'll find the following formula for dB as a vector. This really has to do with the fact that R hat is a unit vector, and therefore it's vector r divided by the length r. Now that assumes, of course, that we introduce a vector that is called r. That would be this vector here. So this is really just a matter of preference. Vector r has a length of r. The magnitude is little r. And so if we take vector r divided by its magnitude, we get r hat, which has magnitude of 1. So it's really a matter of whether your professor or your textbook prefers to introduce r hat or r. I usually go with r hat. 
but you can pick the formula that makes the most sense to you. If you write db in terms of r instead of r hat, you're going to find the following. I'm going to get mu naught i dl cross r divided by 4 pi r cubed. Equally valid, but if you're wondering why one version has r squared in the denominator versus the other one has r cubed, it's not a typo, it's actually because one of them has r hat in the numerator, the other one has r in the numerator. So it's really just a matter of which vector you use in the cross product. So with that said, and we've mentioned how to find the net magnetic field created by this distribution at a point we would integrate over the current distribution, let's talk about a few takeaways, conceptual takeaways from the Biot-Savart law. We'll get into the nitty gritty later, and we'll do all the classic examples that you need to know how to do. But for now, let's just focus on a few conceptual takeaways that are going to be very useful in the future. First things first, the fundamental property of magnetic field lines is that they encircle the current that gave rise to them. Now, if we go back to the drawing here, it's actually easy to see. I drew this magnetic field line as encircling the current I. So I cheated a bit because I already knew that. But the point is that dl cross r hat is there to achieve specifically this. Because as we said, if you do the right hand rule with dl and r hat, you find db into the page. That's at point P. If you change the location, if you take point P here and you repeat the cross product with dl cross r hat, well, of course, then you have to draw the new r hat, right? Because you have a new location. So this would now be your distance r. This would be vector r hat. But then idl cross r hat, if you do the right hand rule, gives you a thumb pointing out of the page, just like db. And so dl cross r hat captures the fact that magnetic field lines encircle the current that gave rise to them. So there's that. Now, two classic scenarios that we're going to see again and again. The first one is the infinite wire of current. And if you want to find the direction of the magnetic field created by an infinite wire of current, it's quite easy to do. You could do it by figuring out the direction of dl cross r hat, that's true. Or you could just do the following. Put your thumb of your right hand in the direction of the current, and then wrap your fingers around your thumb, and they will be in the direction of the field lines of the magnetic field. So if you try that on the figure here on the left, eye points up, wrap your fingers around, you're going to find that the magnetic field encircles this current counterclockwise viewed from above. That's a very simple way to figure out the direction of B. Of course, conversely, if you have the direction of the field lines, you can figure out the direction of the current. The point is, thumb is current, curl your fingers along the field line. Now that's the right-hand rule. And it's the right-hand rule truly applied to DL cross R hat, you just might not realize it. And here's something important. If you go back to the videos talking about the magnetic force, I purposely used the right-hand rule with my fingers like this, to find the direction of the magnetic force. And I will always use that version of the right-hand rule to find the magnetic force. That's because I want to reserve this version, where you curl your fingers around your thumb, to find the direction of the magnetic field lines for a given current. Now, I just said that, but let's look at another example, where it's going to seem like the right-hand rule is reversed. But it's not, it's just a shortcut. So, let me explain. We now have a ring of current, with current I flowing counterclockwise viewed from above. If you take a little piece of this ring of current, and you treat it like the wire that we just discussed, well, you put your thumb in the direction of current, wrap your fingers around your thumb, that gives you the direction of the field lines. And if you do that as you go around the ring of current, you're going to find that the field lines are going to look like this. As you wrap the fingers of your right hand around your right thumb with your thumb in the direction of the current at a given point, you will find that the magnetic field lines look like this. And that's true everywhere. It's true 
in the back here, and so on and so forth. So they're going to wrap around the ring like that, and they're all doing it in the same way, meaning that if you look, all these field lines are coming in from below. And by superposition, what you get is a magnetic field B at the center of the ring that points in this direction. Now that's just at the center. Arguably off-center, that's a different story, but typically with rings of current, we're interested in the direction of the magnetic field and specifically at the center. Now if you want to apply the right-hand rule, which you've been doing, you've been putting your thumb in the direction of current, wrapping your fingers around to find the direction of the field line, you can actually do it faster because it's kind of weird to do that as you go around the ring. What you can do instead is you can wrap your fingers of your right hand in the direction of the ring of current, that would be like this, counterclockwise viewed from above, and then your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. Now that's confusing because it's the exact opposite of what we just did. If you go back up here, it's the opposite. Thumb is current, fingers are field line. Here, it's flipped. Thumb is magnetic field, and fingers are current. Okay, so it's not that there are two different right-hand rules. It's that this is a shortcut that is much more practical. Find the direction of B given a circular ring of current, rather than use the right-hand rule that we defined in, in scenario one. Now again, that's what we've been doing, right? We, we've been taking a little piece of current and wrapping our fingers around it to find these individual field lines like this. It's just that when you take all of them together by superposition, B just points straight up, and therefore this version of the right-hand rule, which is a shortcut, is a lot easier to do to find the direction of the magnetic field in the case of a ring of current. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions, and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.